Well, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and open up your Bibles to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. We're going to read the first 18 verses there in that passage. And as you're turning there, it was several years ago that my family, the five of us, we decided to surprise my parents and my in-laws in coming to visit them. This wasn't during the holiday season. We just wanted to go up and visit them and surprise them and uh, kind of catch them off guard. We love to do surprises. And um, we decided we were living in Houston at the time. So we were flying to St. Louis where my family lives. And then we're going to drive after that to go see Nicole's family, which is like in the northeast corner of Missouri. So we flew in to St. Louis and we get a rental car. We drive to my folks house. I mean, we get there like at midnight. We get there at midnight and we knock on the door. We ring the doorbell and they're not coming. Like, oh my goodness, they're asleep. And so we keep on ringing the doorbell. It's like, do I need to go around the house and bang on their, you know, window right next to it? That'd be really scary. And so we kept on ringing the doorbell. Finally, the door opens and my dad's kind of rubbing his eyes and he kind of looks at us and so he notices that it's us. Like, oh, what are you doing here? We're like, surprise. And so we had our line down. We were ready. And that was the only line he had. Surprise. And it worked. And we were so excited about that. We're like, you know what? In two days, we spent a couple days with my folks. We're going to do the same thing to Nicole's family. So we drive up to see Nicole's family, and we get there. Nobody's home. They're, they're not there. We're like, I thought they were going to be here this way. They're always home. That night, they were not home. But we found out from other family members that they were out to eat, I believe. And so I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to park the rental car behind the barn because they're on, on a farm. I'm going to park it behind the barn so they don't see it. All right. And so, and we already knew the code into the house. And so we put in the code, we're going to stay in the house, lights off. All right. And when they come in, we got our line down. Surprise. All right. And so we do that. We get ready. All of a sudden we see their lights, the headlights coming down the highway. They pull in to the driveway and they usually, you know, go right to the garage. Out of all nights, they decided not to go there. They went around another turn where the barn was, and they saw the car. <laughs> and they paused, and they stopped, and the headlights were on the car. And I'm, we're watching from the living room, <laughs> and it's like too long of a pause, and all of a sudden, I see the reverse lights go on. I turn to Cole, this is not good. <laughs> this is not good. And they pull out. Go to the highway. I said, call your mom. <laughs> call your mom right now. So Nicole gets on the phone. Hey, mom, how's it going? Oh, Nicole, we're doing okay, but here's the deal. We think, I got to let you go because we think somebody is in our house right now. We saw some movement. In fact, we called the cops. We're going to the other barn. We're getting the guns. And so I'm like, and I'm hearing this. I said, tell her it's us. Tell her it's us. And so they get in, they find like, we tell them it's us, they come in, we're like, surprise, it's us. Now why do I, why do I bring that up? You know, because sometimes surprises don't go the way you expect it, okay? Over 2,000 years ago, there was a surprise that took place on a Sunday morning to many. And guess what? It went exactly as planned. It went exactly as God had planned. He had planned this from the very beginning of time. That surprise to many when they saw an empty tomb, it was exciting. Some were confused, some were trying to understand it, but it went right according to what God had planned. If you have your Bibles, hopefully open up now to John chapter 20. We're gonna read verses one through 10. If you got it, say got it. Got it. Those online, if you got it, say got it. <laughs> All right, I'm trusting you. All right. On now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple. Well, that's John, the one whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple, this is John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I want to stop right there. Don't you love it how John like, likes to add that in there? You know, you know, Peter and I, we were running to the tomb, and guess what? I beat him to the tomb. I'm a little bit faster than Peter. Okay, 
Verse 5, and stooping to look in, this is John, he saw the linen cloths. Everybody underline, he saw. He saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And this is what happens with Peter. He saw, everybody underline that. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, this is John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and look at this, he saw and believed. Everybody underline that. He saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Now, in our time together this morning, I want you to write down a few things. This is the first thing I want you to write down. Actually, it's a question. It's a question for all of us. It's a question that we all need to answer. And the question is this, with which set of eyes do you come to the tomb today? Okay, with which set of eyes do you come to the tomb? See, the Greek language has six different verbs translated to see. And in verses 5 through 8 here, we see three different verbs, three different words describing that he saw. Even though in the English language we say he saw, he saw, he saw. But they have three different words with actually three different meanings. And those three different Greek words are blepo. Everybody say blepo. The second one is the, theoreo. Everybody say theoreo. That's a fun one, all right? And then the third one is Edon. Everybody say Edon. Edon. Now, when we see here, we see the three different types of he saw. And John first saw the linen wrappings through the lens of blepo. Through the lens of blepo, meaning that he observed without necessarily understanding. So when he looked and saw, he got there first. And when he looked into the tomb and saw the claws there, he saw it, but wasn't fully comprehending it. He didn't understand it. it was, there was observation without necessarily understanding. Now, like, what, well, what does that mean? Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. Guys, it, it's very hard for us. Sometimes we observe this, and it's, uh, it's hard for us to understand when our spouse or wife says to us, I'm going to go out and run an errand. And you're like, okay. And then about three hours later, she comes back with different bags from all over the city. Yeah. And we're saying, whoa, 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 that's not an errand, that's errands, okay? So you're observing that, like, but you don't fully understand it. Ladies, it's like your, your, your man tells you, okay, I'm going to go out. We're going to go play a, a round of golf. They go out, play a round of golf for four hours. They, they hit balls into the woods all day, all right? They really don't say a word, really, to the other guys in which they're playing golf with. And they come back and say, it was a great day. You don't understand. Or even, even, you know, guys, we get up at four o'clock in the morning, head to a deer blind, freeze our tails off, never shoot off a shot and say, that was the most relaxing morning ever. <laughs> to ladies, they're like, no, that's torture. You know, you don't, you're observing, but you're not completely understanding. Now, there are those of you who are wearing these lens today. You're viewing the tomb through these eyes. And when you hear about the resurrection of Jesus, you don't fully comprehend it. You don't understand it. How could someone rise again? It's impossible. Also, after considering it, there's some that think since it's impossible and they don't completely understand, therefore they don't believe. They, they give up. Now, Peter, however, we see here in verse 6 that he saw the linen cloths through the lens of theoreo. Everybody say theoreo. That's a, that's a fun one. Meaning he examined the clause with the purpose of investigation. So he probably went in there into the tomb and began to look at the clause and seeing that they were already folding. So, okay, nobody can fold this on their own. They had to be, and we already had a tomb that was covered with the stone. So he's investigating. Are these truly the clause in which Jesus was wrapped in? And so he takes the next step to investigate what he is seeing right before him. See, those who look through these lens, they have their curiosities peaked. And not only that, they take the next step. They lean in to discover the purpose of why these things are happening. That's theoreo. They, they don't give up when they hit that first roadblock of confusion. 
They, they lean in and take that next step just understanding it. That might be you today. You, you, you come here to church on Easter and you want to know what all this is about. And you're investigating the claims of Christ. You want to know why people not just come on Sundays, on, on Easter Sunday, but then every Sunday. Why do they do that? Well, it's actually, I'll give you the answer. It's because of this day. Yes. That's the reason why we come together every single day, every single Sunday. It's because of this day. It's Easter. Because without Easter, our faith would be in vain. And so if that's you today and you're investigating and you're leaning in, praise God. I'm glad you are. I'm glad you're here. You're trying to understand this thing called Christianity and why so many of us celebrate Easter. But then you have the, the lens that John saw through. Now, he already saw through the lens of Bleppo. Now he's seeing through the, the, the lens of Edon. Everybody say Edon. Edon. Edon means that he examined everything, but then he perceived it with understanding. Remember, he saw and believed. He saw at first taking it all in. Peter investigated. Now he sees it and then he gets it. He understands. To perceive with understanding and he believed. He got it or we would say it clicked. The light bulb went on. How did it click? Probably in that moment, how it clicked was Isaiah 53 and how the Messiah had to come bear our iniquities, our sins, and then also he was counted with the transgressors with him, those who were the thieves on the cross with him, if we're told of that day that he would be crucified. It clicked. It clicked when Jesus said in Matthew 12 that his death would be like that of Jonah, the story of Jonah, where he would be in the whale, where Jesus would be in the earth, the heart of the earth for three days and for three nights. It clicked. It clicked for them also in that moment when Jesus said in the temple complex, talking with the religious leaders as they're looking in and taking in all just the beauty of the temple. And Jesus said, you tear down this temple, I'll raise it again in three days. And they're like, whoa, 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 that's impossible. It took us decades to build this temple. But Jesus wasn't talking about the building that, they, that surrounded them. He was talking about himself, Amen. his body. He says, you tear down this temple in three days, I will raise it again. It clicked. They perceived with understanding. It clicked because he rose three days later. Let's pick up in verse 11. Now, while they're investigating, they're leaning in. John's believing, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, clicked. She, she recognized his voice now. She turned and said in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher, which leads us to our, our second point is this, is that an empty tomb leads to full hearts. An empty tomb leads to full hearts. She's weeping in this moment. She's grieving still. And then she discovers who is before her. It's not a gardener. Amen. It's not any other man. It's Jesus standing before her. See, for Christians, the empty tomb is a symbol of hope. It's a symbol of faith reminding us this, that death is not the end. Amen. Death is not the end for you and I who are in Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ provides, it provides comfort. It provides peace to those who believe, assuring us that our lives have meaning and purpose even beyond this world. See, whenever you discover something that's empty, it can lead to disappointment. Like for me, Waking up in the morning and grabbing a cereal box and doing this and nothing comes out, that's a disappointing day, all right? I get, I get a little frustrated with that, especially when I bought that box yesterday. It was supposed to be for me, and then I look over and my three girls are eating what I just had bought. I was like, whoa, 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 we still have this little, little 
tiff between me and my, my daughters, okay, about whose cereal box. That's a whole other sermon for another day. About, okay, anyway. But it's disappointing, all right? An empty tank. That's not just disappointing. That could be nerve-wracking. How many of you all, when the gas tank gets about a quarter, a little less than a quarter of a tank, you start heading towards the gas station just by a show of hands? Okay. The, these are our responsible ones, folks, okay, <laughs> right here. How many of you all, like, when you, when you see the light come on, you start heading towards the gas station? Okay, I, I see you. you think, yeah. How many of you all that got two more miles, I think, of this baby? <laughs> We're going to all right, I see you. Okay. See, an empty tank, that's not just disappointing. It could be very nerve-wracking. An empty chair at a dinner table, that, can, that hurts. The loss of a loved one, something empty in the house, that that. That hurts. But the most devastating thing is an empty heart. One that has no fulfillment, one that has no purpose, one that has no joy. And this is where the empty tomb shatters our disappointment. Because an empty tomb means this death has no sting. It means that life is given, it means that sin is is defeated. It means that meaning and purpose are given to us. And not only that, we have joy everlasting. That's what an empty tomb does for us. See, if the tomb wasn't empty, I would be. If the tomb wasn't empty, you would be. We have this God-shaped void in our hearts that cannot be filled except by God alone. And because he rose from the grave, he fills our hearts. Jesus said this, it's good that I go on to be with the Father. It's good that I ascend to the Father. Because when I ascend to the Father, I will give you my spirit. Where does his spirit abide? In us. In our hearts. So the empty tomb, it's more than just great. (laughs) He fills us with himself. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead now abides in you and me who put our faith in him. I don't grasp it. I don't understand it, but I believe it. I'm looking through the lens of Edom. I believe. Do you believe? Let's pick up in verse 17 and 18. Jesus responds back to Mary. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. She's probably grabbing onto me. I had to hold you. You just rose from the grave. He says, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the father. But go to my brothers, underline that phrase, my brothers, and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father. Underline that, my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Which leads us to our last point. See, our faith in Jesus makes us family forever. It makes us family forever. When I started going to church as a little kid, I kept on hearing this phrase and even in greetings, hey brother, how you doing? How's it going brother? I'm like, you guys aren't brothers. You guys don't look alike at all, you know? How are you? You're 65, he's 20. You ain't brothers. There's something going, what, what are you talking about? I didn't grasp this at that time. That when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we are now brothers and sisters in Christ. Whenever you hear the baptisms taking place, I baptize you, my sister. I baptize you, my brother. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because it's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we're family. That's the only reason why we can, how we can be family. And Jesus calls his disciples, my brothers my brothers. You know, most of us over the past few years, we've experienced loss maybe at some level. And when you experience loss, it cuts deep. It cuts deep to the heart, especially when it's very close loved ones. And we realize very, very quickly that this world and also the life that we have, our life in this world is just a vapor. Our, Our life is just a blip on the radar screen of eternity. And it hurts when we see a loved one pass away. But the good news is, is this. Aren't you glad? Aren't, aren't you glad that our life here on earth is not the end? Because those loved ones who have gone on to be with the Lord, 
actually they're more alive right now than we are. That's right. That's right. We get to see them again if you're in Christ. Why? Because you're family forever. What joy that brings to the Christian that when you're there, even at that funeral, and you're grieving, and we are to grieve. We're supposed to grieve with those who grieve, who mourn with those who mourn. But we don't grieve as those with ones that have no hope. Why do we have hope? Because of Easter Sunday. That's the reason why we have hope. Because since Jesus was the first one to defeat death, now we have that same spirit within us that we will defeat death. That we get to live forever with him. We get to see those loved ones again who are in Christ because we are forever family. You know, 180 times in the Gospel of John, Jesus refers to God God as Father. 180 times. 27 times he says, my Father. 71 times he says, the Father. And only one time does he refer to God as the disciples' Father. And it's right here in this verse that you and I just read. Just one time. He does it only here in verse 17. He says that he is ascending to my father and your father. There's a change that takes place. Jesus no no longer calls them his disciples. He calls them, tell my brothers. Why the significant change? It's the resurrection. Because now we are brothers with Christ, with God as our father. Hello. They go from students, disciples, the duh disciples that we talked about the past few weeks. They don't get it sometimes. To now brothers. To a forever family. Are you part of that forever family? Have you placed your faith in Jesus? See, there has to be a change in relationship in order for this to happen. The only reason that this change can take place is by having a relationship with Jesus Christ. See, there's a lot of changes that are taking place even in these 18 verses that we just read. We see a grave change from full to empty. We see John change from just seeing to believing. We see change within Mary who is once grieving, now is rejoicing. We see a change in the address of the disciples. They are no longer disciples and students. They are now brothers in Christ. What is the change? We understand that the change is because of Jesus. There's the power. This is the power of the resurrection. Change. And God alone is the one who can make that change within you and within me. See, when God makes that change with you, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ... You know what the change that takes place in your own life? You go from sinner to saint. You go from broken to whole. You go from addicted to free. You go from lost to found. You go from blind to now see. You go from now once an enemy of God to now being part of the family of God. That's the change that takes place. You can't do it on your own. You can't get salvation on your own. You can't raise from the dead on your own. It's only because of the change that God does in you because of Christ and defeating the cross, defeating death, and rising again. That's the only way. So how can this change take place in your life? You do what John did. You believe. It's that simple. You believe. See, we're, we're all going to spend eternity forever somewhere. Somewhere. Those of us who believe will get to spend eternity with Jesus the Son and God the Father and everyone else who place their faith in Him forever. But those who do not believe will spend an eternity away from God the Father and Jesus the Son in a place called hell. But because of Easter, our faith is not in vain. Because of Easter, we go from death to life. Because of Easter, we get to spend eternity together. Do you believe? Father, we we come to you right now knowing that we need you, but Lord, also humbled and thankful, rejoicing that you defeated death, that when those eyes came to the tomb that day, there was nobody in there. It was just cloths Your body had risen. 
signifying that you are the son of God. But not only that, Lord, that we, as your children, get to experience that same resurrection if we place our faith in you. There's some here in the room this morning that you haven't taken that next step and you're looking through these different lenses and you might be investigating and that's okay. My prayer is that you would take that next step and believe. Believe that Jesus rose from the grave. Place your faith in him. Admit your need for him, that you are a sinner. And you can pray a simple prayer like this because we know that as scripture says, for if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so if that's you this morning, you can pray a simple prayer like this. You can just follow me and just say in the quietness of your heart, say, Father, I've sinned. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. Thank you for sending your son to die for me. I place my faith I believe in him. I believe that he rose again. Forgive me my sins, Lord. I place my faith in you. Thank you for new life. And the best way I know how I'm gonna live for you. If you prayed that prayer, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. That's the most important decision that you'll ever make in your entire life. If that's you with nobody looking, I just want you to do me a huge favor, just me just between you and me, you raise your hand right now. That's you and you prayed that prayer. Awesome. Thank you. Hands all across the room. Thank you. Father, we thank you for salvation. Lord, we thank you for new life. Lord, we cannot have new life without you. So God, we pray and we thank you for the new life that just took place here in this moment. Uh, You save, you save even today, Lord. God, we rejoice with full hearts for we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? This is going to be a time that we get to respond. We're going to respond in different ways. But I want to say this. For those of you who prayed that prayer and you believed it and you raised your hand, thank you for just even the boldness of doing that. And raise your hands and I prayed that prayer. I want to just say this to those who raise your hand, okay? I want to tell you what's happening right now, even as we speak. In Luke chapter 15, verse 10, Jesus said this, that when a sinner repents of their ways, all of the angels rejoice in heaven. All of heaven erupts because your name is now written in the Lamb's book of life. So let me tell you this, those of you who raise your hands, there's a party going on in heaven right now because of you, for what you did, and placing your faith in him. It's the most important decision that you will ever make. So during this time of response, we're going to have our staff up here. If you would like to come down, we'd love to meet you. And all you got to say to me, if you pray that prayer, is say those four words. I prayed that prayer. I prayed that prayer. We want to rejoice with you. There's some of you that have prayed that prayer, but you haven't taken that next step as you've seen those before you in getting baptized. What a beautiful picture of the resurrection buried with Christ in his death, raised to walk in in newness of life because of what Christ has done in defeating death. We'd love to talk with you about that. Or maybe you're saved. You know you're going to have a forever family, but you don't have a church family here on earth. We'd love to be that family. We'd love for you to take the next steps in joining this great church um, that I'm so glad to be a part of. Or maybe you just want to stand there and just raise your hands and just praise God for what he's done in this moment. However it is, let's respond to the goodness of our God as we sing.